My notes uh, should say parts one and two, but they just say part one. So we're going to make this part 1.2 or something like that and uh, just carry on. We'll correct the documentation later. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A little, a little word of greeting to uh, young Samuel out there listening online. I hope he's not feeling well this morning, so he and his mom are staying home. But uh, hopefully this greeting, little Sam, will bring a smile to your face. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15. Let me read the opening verses again of the chapter as we, as we begin. This portion is extraordinarily important. In a sense, though, it's extraordinarily basic and extraordinarily simple. And at the same time, if you ponder it for just a little while, you will find it deeply profound. It's one of those passages like that in Scripture and it's just an amazing section of the Bible, and we want to look at it with great care this morning. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, that is Peter, then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom, of course at Paul's writing, at the time of his writing, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Notice Paul. He sees himself as the last and the least. He also sees himself as the chief of sinners, by the way. That's from another portion. He says, I'm the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. We trust God to help us this morning as we enter into the study of His Word. Last week we looked at the doctrine of Christian resurrection and we focused a moment on the importance and centrality of that doctrine. Most commonly to, we use that word to refer to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And generally the word resurrection refers to the resurrection, the raising of a body that is dead to life again. Say so key elements, a body that's dead, a body. It's a real bodily resurrection. It's a material, physical, objective thing, not an ethereal, spiritual, in your mind kind of thing. And it is a major part of our hope. Why would the Apostle Paul languish in jail in Caesarea for two years under house arrest, and then in Rome under house arrest for that amount of time, years and years, for a something that was really not true, something that really wasn't going to happen. He recognized that in Christ, the hope of Israel was brought to fruition. Their hope, he said, in his trials was the resurrection of the dead. And of course, associated with that, a resurrection to life, if you believe in God and, and righteousness and all of that, and the eternal fulfillment of the promises of God to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David in the New Covenant and all the rest of it in the Old Testament. All of those promises were bound up in the doctrine of the resurrection. If you don't live again, you cannot see those promises be fulfilled. And that, Paul knew that, and that's, that's what his hope was. And he had that hope of resurrection from the Old Testament scriptures, and, and he found that it was completely fulfilled in Christ, and Christ was the could I say it this way, the means, the mechanism, the machinery by which would be brought to pass that hope of resurrection. How are you going to have a hope of resurrection if nobody actually does it, if nobody actually defeats death? He did 
Christ did defeat death, and Paul saw in that that hope of resurrection. And that's why he sat in jail for all that time, because he knew something that was true that these people who put him in jail uh, denied and did not think was true. And that's what will carry us through when we face persecution too, will it not? Pastor Coates in Canada, carrying him through his jail stay. I didn't even hear if that, what happened at that Friday hearing, but here it is, our neighbor to the north, imprisoning Christian pastors for wishing to do what God tells them to do, to gather to worship the Lord God. What has our Western world come to? It's come to foolishness, come to evil and wickedness. But on this doctrine of resurrection, I added this to the notes, and the, the revision is in your hand there. If you took a bulletin, it's also online from last week, so there's, much, you know, there's quite a few changes here. But in the first section, just this new third point, letter C, I address us as believers, and I say, dear believer, you must not be ashamed of believing in the resurrection of Christ, nor in the resurrection of all humanity. Why should you or I be embarrassed about the doctrine of resurrection that the infinitely powerful God can give life to the dead when he's the one who initially created those human beings in the first place. Why be backed into a corner because you believe that people would be raised from the dead? Jesus predicted of himself that he would rise from the dead, and then he did so with eyewitness proof. Why is that so unreasonable? I'm trying to buttress your confidence in the doctrine of the resurrection because you'll go out there and somebody will say, you believe in the resurrection? Yeah. Don't be caught like a deer in the headlights when somebody says that. You know they're going to say that. But think about the ridiculousness of their belief system compared to your belief in the coming resurrection of Christ. Why is it unreasonable to believe in bodily resurrection? But it's okay to believe that life came from evolution. That's a fairy tale. Why is it ridiculous to believe in the resurrection, but it's okay to kill a baby in the womb, which 75% of people believe in the United States believe should be legal? Why is it that it's okay to believe there's life on other planets, but it's not okay to believe in the resurrection of the dead? Why is it okay to believe that girls can become boys and boys can become girls, but it's not okay to believe in the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of his people? Which is more ridiculous? Those beliefs of the world are what they call our belief in resurrection. They say, you're, you're imagining. No, you're imagining. Obvious things that should be, should be obvious to all people. We don't come from nothing. It's not okay to kill a baby in the womb. Boys are boys and girls are girls. There is no life on other planets. As interested as I always was and still am in space exploration, they are not going to find little green men on Mars with that new rover that's up there, okay? They're going to be sorely disappointed about that, okay? They won't find you know, anybody of any color up there, okay, Much, whether green or not. But they're not going to find bacteria and microbes and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's kind of just a waste, you know, all that, in a sense. Why don't we focus on our problems here? We have enough problems. Why, why, why spread our sinful condition out to other planets in the solar system? We can't even handle it here. Begins at home, does it? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, last time we looked at wrong views of the afterlife, and we looked at uh, annihilationism. We understood conditional immortality, these wrong views that are held by uh, the cults. We looked at the spiritual resurrection view, purgatory, soul sleep, uh, reincarnation. And so we've, we've defined all those. We've looked at those. We're not going to go over those again. The notes have all that there for you. We go then to the text in 1 Corinthians 15, 
where the Apostle Paul tells us of the gospel that saves from sin, the gospel that saves to heaven, the gospel that saves from God's judgment, the gospel that saves to God's mercy. This, moreover, adds to the topics that the Apostle Paul has been addressing to the Corinthian church, and it's perhaps the most important of them all. <clears throat> he really exclaims to them, moreover, brothers, now listen, listen, I'm telling you the gospel which I preached to you at the first, which you received and in which you stand. I'm going to define that for you. I'm going to make it clear, and that's so needed even today. People don't even know what the gospel is today. It's very confused because of all the different teachings that have gone out. I've summarized it briefly in the notes uh, on page, well, it's my page five, maybe it's your page four or something, but it's my, the definition is in the uh, sidebar box there. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, that he came to save sinners such as ourselves. This is the same gospel that Paul delivered to them originally. There was no new one, no different one, as we said, no adjusted one, no inventive or innovative one, just the one. He handed them that sacred deposit that was to be protected and lived out. This is exactly what Jude said in Jude chapter 1, the only chapter, verse number 3, in which he said, you know, I was going to write to you about our common salvation, which was once delivered to the saints, but something came up, and I've ha I have to write something different to you. But that, that, that gospel was deposited in the church, and we are expected to continue that same teaching, that same doctrine, that same truth, generation to generation until the Lord returns. We cannot afford to have a telephone game thing happen to the gospel from one generation to the next in our day. We must maintain the clarity, the truth, the content of the gospel, the same one that the Apostle Paul preached. And, it says, when, which they had also received. They welcomed it as it was from God. They said, yeah, we recognize this is not just Paul's word. This is a word through Paul from God. This is, this is, this is divine revelation. This is Paul as an emissary of Jesus Christ, a personal representative, giving us his word in his place. They came to believe that the gospel was true. Not only that Jesus died on the cross for sins and sinners, but that he did that, and it applies to me. It applies to me. I need that message. I need that work of God in my life. And so they saw the impact of the message in their lives. Many of them were transformed. They were lifted out of a life of sin. It should have been obvious in Corinth all kinds of wickedness there. It's, you know, it was the, you know, it's always easier for us to think about the sin that other people do, so we'll go, we'll say, okay, they were like Las Vegas, you know, how bad those people are there. About as bad as the people in Ann Arbor, but we'll just, we'll just say Las Vegas just for convenience sake, because we don't want to get too convicted. Uh, they were like them, immoral, promiscuous, possibly drugs, certainly idolaters. When they got saved, they didn't look like that anymore. Their lives were changed. And of course, the Apostle Paul was helping them to complete that transformation, that, that change in their lives in, in terms of their conduct. But they received the gospel, it says at the end of verse 1. You received it, and he, Paul says, and in which you stand. The idea is that they were to remain in that truth. The evidence of receiving the gospel in the past is standing in it in the present. Only those purified by, by Jesus can stand before God. Um, let me share with you, uh, I think I've got this verse listed in your notes there, in the Psalms. And this is not exactly the meaning of the word stand, but I just thought I might, I might help you with this. Uh, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? Who may stand in God's holy place? He who has, a clean, who, who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So this is something like, that stand is like, who is going to be able to be present there in the holy place of God? Who is going to be able to stand? Or if 
God should mark iniquities who no one would be able to stand. If he, if he took your iniquities into account, if he just closed his eyes to the work of Christ for a moment, imagine, and you had to bear all the weight of your sins on your own shoulders, who would stand? No one. Now, this stand is not exactly that, that same kind of stand, but it's the this, this standing of holding firm and remaining in their belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not wavering away from it. They're not like, you know, the, the, some of the Hebrew people in the book of Hebrews were like, eh, we heard the gospel, but, you know, our Jewish family and friends are really, they're really piling on us here, and it's, been, it's difficult, and we're being ostracized and persecuted and put in jail, and could, maybe we could just kind of back off a little bit from this gospel and Paul says, no, we must stand. They experienced salvation in the past, and it has ongoing effects in the present. This stand is in the perfect tense, which means it has a point of initiation at the beginning with ongoing results. It's like, you know, as it is written, and it's still written, in which you have come to stand and still stand stand. That's what we do. That's why belief is not a momentary activity. It's you believed and still believe. You repented and still repent. That's the ongoing effects. So just as important as this question, did you receive the gospel? Did you receive the gospel? But just as important as this question, are you still standing in the gospel. Are you still standing in the gospel? This message is the one that saves them from eternal death. Verse 2 says, by which also you are saved. Being saved, standing in that salvation, still believing, you are saved from eternal death. That's why it's good news. Um, anyone who embraces the person of Christ and his message likewise stands or exists in a state of salvation. Now, what does it mean for, if you're new to uh, this channel, so to speak, uh, what does it mean to be saved? It means to be rescued from the dreadful consequences of sin in this life and especially after death. It means being brought near to God instead of being an enemy of God, instead of being separated from Him. To be saved means to be forgiven. Means to be means to be justified. It means to be uh, transformed, to be recreated, to be given new life. That's what saved means. It's a it's a big word, even though it's a short word. It's a very important word. And we teach here, as the Scripture does, that Christian salvation is permanent. But maybe I should better say it this way: True salvation is permanent. Genuine salvation is permanent. Those who are truly saved will hold fast the message of Christ. But look in verse number 2, by which also you are saved, if, that if, that's a bothersome word, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless, there's another bothersome word, unless you believed in vain. And I touched on this at the end of our message last time. I just want to do that again. To me, you might say, well, look, either we're saved or we're not. And uh, what is this if business? And you say, how do you put that together? As I've studied the scriptures over the years, I feel that tension that I've just mentioned to you, but I've come to the point where that tension has become not a tension for me. Because I understand that true salvation is that which begins and has an ongoing. It has that perfect tense aspect to it. We believed and we continue believing. We repented and continue repenting on the timeline of our life. But if we believed, quotes, and then it stops at some point, and then we say, no, I don't believe. What does that mean? Well, that means that this belief over here, the quotes around it were actual quotes. It wasn't real. You see that? You, because a true, pers a true believer, a person who really understands, I'm a sinner, I'm destined for hell, and God has provided salvation, and I believe in Christ, somebody who really understands that can never leave that message behind. That is, 
that is so eternally compelling, so, so transformative when God works in you, and that's really the issue, you know, believing with quotes is not the same as believing when God convicts you of sin because God does that work in your heart. But in any case, if you don't hold fast, the if and the unless are important. Uh, if you don't believe, if you don't hold fast, if you don't continue to stand, that proves that you're not and never were truly a child of God. And the same, uh, I'll call it uh, tongue-in-cheek, bothersome if is found in Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, again, I know the tension that you feel if you've struggled with this doctrine, but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of in the rearview mirror for me because I understand how perseverance works, how continuance in belief works. Hebrews 3, verse number 14 says, We have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. One objection that might be raised that I'm thinking of right now is, what do you mean, if? Does that mean that I have to do something in order to be saved or keep my salvation? Well, it, it means that you will be doing something, but it's not because you're doing it that you're saved. It's because God began a good work in you, and that work which he's working in you, you're doing what? You're working out through the work that God does in you. And so they were called here, Paul was calling them not to believe in vain. Don't believe with air quotes around it. Uh, believe truly. Because if you don't believe truly, then there's really a demonstration that there's no ultimate purpose, no, there's no substance to what you're doing. The point of this is Paul is dealing with those who once said they believed in Christ, but now do not. If you still believe in him, if you really do, I'm talking to you now, not you Corinthians, but you Fellowship Bible Church, you people watching online. If you really believe in him, you don't have to worry about the if. The if will take care of itself. Those who believe will be kept by God, and no one can snatch them out of the state of salvation. But the Corinthian church was so shot through with problems that Paul had to raise the difficult possibility that some of them had believed in vain. I mean, how do you believe the gospel of Jesus truly and experience that transformation and then say, uh, what, continue to eat at idle temples and uh, have issues with divorce and this immorality in the church and taking your brothers to law and worrying about what the world says about your message? How do all those things fit? So there's some question there. And Paul carries on that line of thinking to them, just warning them in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 5. He says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Verse 3, Paul says, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received. Now, if you want to memorize two verses on the gospel, these are the two verses to memorize. And if this is too much for you to memorize these two verses, then may I give you the um, even shorter version of it. You might, you might underline it. Here's the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You could just say Christ died for our sins and then skip into verse 4, and that he rose again the third day. Now, I'm not trying to snip the, the gospel into smaller pieces for you. We don't do that here. But for your memorization purposes, what's the gospel? Christ died for our sins, and he rose again. Now, what do you do with a dead person? You bury them. And that's what, doesn't that, isn't that what this text says? He was buried. And what happened after Christ rose again? from the dead. They saw him. So you have Christ died and he was buried. He rose again and he was seen. So you have two main points. He died for our sins and he rose again from the dead. Memorize those. But to prove that he died, he was buried. To prove that he rose again from the dead, he was seen. Okay, That's it. That's the short version of 
of verses 3 and 4. Let's look at them in a little more detail just to flesh that out. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, the Bible says. This is what Paul delivered to them at first. This was the message. The fact is that Jesus died as a sacrifice, as a lamb or a bull or a goat in the Old Testament died when the priest and the, actually, yeah, the priest, but also in many cases the person laid their hand on that sacrifice and then slit the throat of that sacrifice to signify my sin caused his death, the innocent one, to die. That's what Jesus did. He died as a sacrifice for this matter of sin. Now look at this carefully. Christ died. Now that's a tact. today, has been for years. Other world religions attack that doctrine. The fact is that Christ died. And then it says in verse 4 that he was buried. Now the Romans knew how to kill people. They were quite expert at that subject matter. So don't insult them by saying they didn't get the job done. They had the job done the various theories about how he didn't die or somebody took his place or he swooned or, you know, he was just passed out and then they put him in a stone-cold tomb for three days and miraculously he got, felt better after, you know, resting for a while. What silliness, what foolishness. Uh, you know, seriously injured but not to the point of needing medical attention. Come on, people. He died. The, the historical record could not be more clear about that. In fact, there's no, more, there's no more record for the death of, you know, the Caesar, the Caesar Augustus or whoever, than there is of the death of Jesus Christ. And it's very clear. Um, but going back to the verse here, verse 3, Christ died for our sins. That is critical. Uh, this is attacked as well. People say, no, he died as an example. He died um, to show that God's kind of displeased about sin. And, or he died as a, as a model for self-giving. That's not what the Bible teaches. Those poor animals didn't die as a model for self-giving. They died as punishment for the sins of the people whom they represented on that altar. And Jesus, likewise, for sins died. And when it says for, that's a loaded word there. He died in our place. He died as our substitute. He died to our advantage. He died because of our sin. Now, as I said before, this is basic, but it's also profound, isn't it? When you think about it. The atonement of Christ was substitutionary. This is the glorious truth of the gospel, that God made him to be sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. Why did God allow a substitute? From, from ancient history past, he allowed an animal to substitute in place of a person. He didn't have to do that. But graciously, he does permit a substitute, even when the crime is a capital crime. We can't do that today, right? Like, I could pay your fine for some civil infraction, but I could not go to the electric chair for you because you would have to yourself. That's how guilt, guilt is attached to the person so intrinsically that it cannot be removed in our civil and criminal law system. Okay, but in God's economy, for some gracious reason, he has allowed a substitute, and I think part of it is to show his magnanimous grace and glory to his people. Think about, for all eternity, we will be worshiping God, thanking him that he has saved us from death and sin and hell and from the, the problems in this life and society and world to live in a perfect place with him as his people, and he our God, and we serving him forever and ever and ever. 
we will praise him for that. And that will, I think that's one of the reasons why this idea of substitution, that his, that his largesse, his benevolence will be praised forever and ever and ever. Substitution. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that our sins were laid on him. Let me just read the verse to you. 1 Peter 2 and 24, it says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness. By his stripes you are healed. His wounds were for our healing. His stripes were for our peace. He was crushed so that we could be free. He was cut off so that we could be caught up to heaven. His death was not merely an example. It was a substitution. And notice, too, the text of the Bible says he died for what? Our sins. You know, not the sins of everybody else, not the sins of the people in Las Vegas. Well, that too, but not theirs, ours. The sins of every single human being. Himself accepted, of course. He was really human, but he had no sin to bear or to pay for. Jesus died for our sins. I'll take you back to 1 Peter chapter th uh, 3 this time and verse 18. Notice this, it ties the sins to the sinners. For Christ also suffered once for sins. And that's, that's tough enough for us to think about. But add this, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. What am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say is that he did not only die for sins, but he died for our sins, and he not only died for our sins, he died for us as sinners, because only sinners commit sins, right? So he died for us. He died for our sins, which means he died for us personally. Sinners and their sins are inextricably linked. Look, if you don't, if you don't come to faith in Christ, your sins are, are tied to you, okay? Okay? But if you come to faith in Christ, he loosens those sins from you and takes them upon himself. But if you insist to hold them to yourself, then you will have to take care of them eternally. You will have to pay for those sins eternally. But he died for our sins. Died for sinners. Now it says also, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. It had to be that he died for our sins, because the Bible said so. He made his soul, Isaiah 53, you hear it? Verse 10, he made his soul an offering for sin. Those events had to happen as they were pre-scripted in history, in prophecy. Now, an objection was raised to me before, well, the Bible says nothing about human sacrifice. I mean, Abraham was told to Sacrifice Isaac, but not really because, you know, there was a sub substitute provided. There we go back to that idea. True enough, there was no prescription for human sacrifice, but a substitution was prescribed in the law. And here we have a volunteer, a divine human volunteer, coming and offering himself as a sufficient substitutionary payment for all humanity, and God accepted that sacrifice. That is the marvel of marvels that he did that for us. And in fact, if you go back to that, uh, that Isaiah 53 verse, he made his soul, the soul of the servant, an offering for sin. There's a human sacrifice right there. That is the one case in which a person gives his life in place of another. You know, that doesn't happen. Maybe for a good person, some people would die, right? Maybe for a president, some secret service agent would take the bullet. But not for an unrighteous person. Not for your enemy. That doesn't make sense to the human mind. After he died for my sins, and me as a sinner, it says he was buried. 
Now, it doesn't say that he was buried according to the scriptures, but it could say that because that was also according to the scriptures. It's understood from the context. Anybody who's read the Old Testament and New Testament knows Christ was ordained to die and to be buried, not to be cremated for sure, but to be buried. We can glean as much from Psalm 16. David was a prophet. And he said, you will not leave, what, my soul and Sheol. You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. There's the grave right there. Isaiah 53, 9, he made his grave with the wicked and the rich at his death. Christ gave the parallel of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be what? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Burial, he predicted. The Bible's replete with these words and, and also general statements about how Jesus had to suffer, and then after he suffered what? Glory. Suffering and glory, and that suffering would include being put into the tomb. So he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Often in our zeal to simplify the gospel or maybe to make it more palatable to the lost, we often leave out the point that Jesus rose again from the dead. But remember, we're not going to be ashamed of the resurrection. Those who ought to be ashamed are those who believe the imaginary things that I listed earlier. They ought to be ashamed, and they will be ashamed when they stand before God and they see him in all of his glory and the eyes of fire that burn through all of the excuses and all of the nonsense and get right down to the heart of the matter. Then they will be embarrassed. We need not be embarrassed about this truth. He rose again the third day. To say that Jesus died for your sins is not quite enough. It's critically important. But if he died and did not rise again, no one can be saved. If he, if he did not rise, the ethical debt of sin has not been fully paid. You understand that the way that you know that your sin debt has been paid is that Jesus is alive again. If he's still dead, then you have no idea that he's not still paying for your sin or that he was just lying and you're going to pay for your sin. You see that? There has to be the resurrection of Christ. Otherwise, the ethical debt of our sin has not been provably paid. Um, some of you that may be kind of really keen, closely paying attention, I said ethical, ethical debt. Don't think of sins as a um, financial kind of thing, like in numerical terms. Like I did X sins, so Jesus had to suffer X amount, you know, $10 and $10. Don't think of sin in that financial way. That's a, that's a metaphor or an illustration we can use. We often say he paid our sin debt, and we probably think of money. But the, the debt is not really monetary. It's not fiscal. It's not financial. It's ethical. It's that one sin is enough to doom somebody to eternal punishment. One sin. One smallest little thing you can think of was enough to condemn Christ to die on the cross. That's the ethical idea of the debt that we owe to the holy God. The infinitely holy God requires infinite justice and holiness. Now, the Bible says this in Romans 10.9, if you declare, if you confess with your mouth, what? The Lord Jesus. And... Believe in your heart that what? God raised him from the dead. If you're going to memorize another verse, you better memorize that one. Okay, very important. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved. That is a promise of God. This is a switch of allegiance to Christ. You know, he's my Lord now, not Caesar, not science, not myself, Jesus. And... Belief that God raised him from the dead. In other words, you acknowledge his finished cross work. That is an indication of true salvation. Once again, the text says he did this. He, he rose again according to the scriptures. Uh, we looked at Psalm 16. We, we saw Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, you might wish it could be more clear, but it's pretty clear. 
He, made, he, he gave his soul an offering for sin. He made his grave with the wicked. And then God says, I will give him a portion with the strong and the great. He will share in the spoils because he has offered himself for sins. And so the resurrection is implicit there. And we know from other texts of Scripture, Paul's hope in the resurrection of Christ. Paul saw the resurrected Christ. Luke 24, the resurrected Christ walking on the road to Emmaus, says to the disciples there, the two you know, foolish and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, all that stuff, the suffering and the glory had to be fulfilled before uh, Christ could, be, could reign on his glorious throne and, and all of that. In fact, in um, Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16, 17, and 20, he told the disciples, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be betrayed, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to rise again the third day. He told them that ahead of time. And in, in Matthew 28, they went to the tomb they saw the angels who said, well, why, are you seeking the, why, why, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. In one month, we celebrate that great truth on Resurrection Sunday. We're justified by the work of Christ. John 19.30, it is finished. And the resurrection of Christ shows, indeed, that that work is finished. Now, the objection naturally comes. Jesus could not rise from the dead because dead people don't rise. I've only ever seen white swans before, so there must not be such things as black swans. Have you ever heard of that? You, read, you know about Nicholas Talbot's book, The Black Swan? And that's an, it's an interesting idea, the whole black swan idea as he puts it forth, but it's based on this, that if all you've ever seen is white swans and you think there's only white swans, you'd be very surprised to know that there are black ones, and there are. They do, I'm not you know, t- making this up. I could, and it'd be just as fine of an illustration, but it's real. So think about that logic. If you've only ever seen one kind, you say there's not another kind. You've, n- you've never seen somebody rise from the dead, so therefore it can't happen? Well, there's a lot of things I haven't seen. You know, I didn't see Neil Armstrong on the moon. I still believe that he was there. You know, sorry to all the conspiracy theorists out there, but I think he was there, that we put him there, and all the other men that went up there as well. I didn't see it, though. So very illogical to say just because I haven't experienced it, it can't happen. Now, it says further then in verse number 5, and that he was seen... So I used this um, verse with a man who I understand subsequently became born again, um, who was a skeptic years and years ago. And uh, I I was able to witness to him, I think it was at a funeral, if I'm not mistaken. Um, And I said, you know, look, the, the scripture teaches us the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. And this fellow was, happened to be a private investigator. And I asked him this. I said, if you had this list of eyewitnesses in a case that saw X, whatever X was, do you think that would pretty much button up the case? Yeah? Peter saw Jesus risen from the dead. The 12 saw him risen from the dead. 500 people at one time saw him raised from the dead, alive over the course of 40 days. He appeared to uh, the disciples, to Peter. He appeared to James. Then again, all the apostles, verse 7, and then finally also to the apostle Paul. Who doesn't get mentioned here? Well, all the women that he was seen by in the first day or two of his resurrection, right? Those were the Marys and all of them and and Matthew, and Luke, you have all those as well. Maybe they're included in the 500. But listen, if somebody said, so-and-so is alive, and I've got 512 witnesses to prove it, and they call them all up to the stand, and they you know, evaluate their mental fitness, and they see that, you know, yep, they saw that, and this was the date, and these were the circumstances, and you know, he was real, and he, didn't, uh, he wasn't a ghost, and there wasn't a hallucination, and the person wasn't on drugs, and wasn't drunk, and all of that. 512 times. 
Do you think the jury would say, yep, he's alive? Of course they would. Beyond any kind of reasonable doubt, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. We could find other witnesses, as I've alluded to in the Gospels. But all of this is to say there's solid eyewitness evidence of both Jesus' death and of his resurrection. And I want you to use that in your evangelism with people. Don't just say that he was raised from the dead. Say he was raised from the dead and hundreds of people observed him personally. Over 40 days? Look at Acts chapter 1, 3, by the way. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 3. <clears throat> I'll start in verse um, 1 that Luke says, The former account of Luke I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, that is, after his passion, as it's called, after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he didn't just appear to them for five minutes on one day when they were in an altered state of consciousness, you know, under some hallucinogenic drug. He saw them, they saw him over 40 days in many different places and times. In fact, he was alive from the dead. Yet the sad reality is most of humanity doesn't believe that still. You know, you can tell people things that are true and obvious and have plenty of evidence and they still don't believe. As long as the lie is repeated loud enough and long enough, they will believe the lie rather than believe the truth. That's why we've got to be so skeptical about what we hear today. We must be a skeptic. Because the source of most of your news is what? Is it heaven? No. It's at best the world, if not the devil. So we have to be skeptical. Now, verses 9 to 11, quickly, I won't belabor this, but Paul says, I was the least of this group of people who witnessed the Lord. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. You know, I, I am nothing. You have to appreciate this guy's humility. He is the you know, eminent apostle to the Gentiles, new revelation from God, a, a vision of, of heaven. And yet he says, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I'm last. I'm least because I persecuted the church. You look, look at there. I persecuted the church of God at the end of verse number 9. Verse uh, Ephesians 3.8 says the same thing. He's considered himself, 1 Timothy 1, the chief of sinners. The reality is we're all the chief of sinners because we ought to look at ourselves and, and forget about, you know, in a sense you're forgetting about everyone else and you're saying, man, I am. Isn't there a book with that title? Did Bunyan write that? Chief of Sinners? Somebody look that up and let me know. My memory might have failed on that. But think of that. Chief of Sinners. Chief of Sinners. Paul thought of himself as. And so he's very grateful to the grace of God in verse number 10. By God's grace, I am what I am. And you just could uh, replace your name in there. By the grace of God, I am what I am. You are what you are. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Now, here's, here's the thing I mentioned last week that was really kind of enlightening and instructive to me. Um, he was not a self-made man. He did not pull himself up by his own bootstraps. He was a man made by the grace of God. And we should be mindful of that ourselves. But when you are mindful of that, notice also this. You... Full-throated acknowledgement, I am made by the grace of God. But then Paul says, and his grace toward me was not in vain. I picture this like Paul is saying, there is a deposit of rich uh, favor that he has given to me. And the question is now, what am I doing with that deposit of favor? 
It was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. So that, or with me, that grace that he's deposited is that which is working out in Paul's life. But notice that Paul was an active participant with that grace, and he said, I didn't waste it. I am taking that grace, and I am making the most out of it. I am squeezing every possible little bit out of God's grace that I can. I labored more abundantly than all of those apostles. I traveled farther. I preached more. I gave myself more. I suffered more. I was nearly killed many times. I took that grace of God, and I ran with it full bore. I didn't slow down. I didn't stop. I worked hard with that grace of God. And so some do take better advantage of God's grace than others. They put in more effort. They put in more study. They put in more work. They do more evangelism, and they generally get more results. What happens if you don't plant any seed? But if you plant a lot of seed, not all of it's going to germinate, but you'll get more generally in the crop in the end. Paul put in a ton of effort to labor diligently with God's grace so that he would have a bigger impact for God. How about you? Are you taking that grace that he has poured into your life and using it wisely, or is it just sitting there growing dusty and moldy in your life? Paul preached very diligently with that grace of God. Everywhere he made converts, among his converts were the Corinthians, but the question for them was, were they going to receive the grace of God in vain? Were they going to turn away from the gospel? Were they just temporary disciples? Or were they going to take up the mantle and say, we are going to use that grace to the maximum and live for God the best way that we can? And so we close our message today, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for this message about your grace, about your gospel. And Father, I pray that if anyone listening does not know Christ, that they will fall upon their face, they will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, and they will recognize that you raised him from the dead and so be saved. In that recognition, Lord, I pray that they will repent of their sins and, and, and know that once they believe in Christ, they are truly forgiven, washed, cleansed, the burden is gone, and they can live free from the bondage and the ethical debt of sin. In Jesus' name, amen.